Welcome to Words of Aloha with Pastor Izzy Manzo of Amazing Grace Ministries International. We're headquartered in Kailua Kona on the Big Island of Hawaii. Join us now as we get into God's Word. Father in heaven, we thank you for this day, and we just pray that as we open up your word, Lord, that it would, it would be real and living, Lord, and help us to apply these truths to our life, Lord, that we can walk um, changed, and not, not just changed on Sundays, but Monday, Sunday through, through Saturday, and it's back to Sunday again, Lord, just help mm. us to walk with you. We ask that now in Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. amen. All right. Thank Sunday you, Sunday school over there. Yeah, so the guys that want to go to Bye. Sunday school? Over, follow Aaron over to that yonder spot. It's tough having church on a beach, you know. The kids hate it. They just. <laughs> can you imagine? I mean, think. Does anyone else here grow up going to not church on a beach, like in a building, and you had to go inside and sit in a little room and color little pictures of fish and things God made? Our kids don't do that. They go and look at the real fish in the tide pool there, and uh, in the keiki pond, and have to, you know have the coolest Sunday school. I remember when Auntie Lorena was doing Sunday school and I'm up here teaching the word and I look over and all the kids are standing up to their ankles in the, in the water over there with binoculars. And they're all like this looking, whoa, ah, ooh, ooh. And I had to go try it afterwards because they were looking at these little um, peppermint candy looking shrimp. They're red and white striped. And and they're banded coral shrimp and they were looking through binoculars and they look like lobsters you know when you got this binoculars and you're only this far away and um she was like this and she's so knowledgeable about all the little interactions and the ways that the creatures live in the ocean you know and so she's teaching them a full-out biology lesson at sunday school and they're digging it you know and i'm like what a creative sunday school teacher to say this is the bible says all of creation declares how great our creator is. It all testifies of his handiwork, the psalmist said. So we have the Lord's creation all around us. You might even see some, some uh, dolphins jump behind me while we're doing the, the study. That's just God showing off his living wallpaper for you this morning. And, um, and for that, it makes me feel closer to God. I, kn I think if Jesus was here on earth today, this would be like his kind of setup. You know, I've been to Israel, see, seen where he taught, taught like at the lakeside on the side of a mountain. He'd bring his disciples to a little oasis called Caesarea Philippi in the desert. There's this little natural spring of water that oozes out from a rock and just, it doesn't even gush. It just like gently flows out and so peaceful there. And it's all desert all around except this one green little lush area. That's where he brought the disciples and said, who do men say that I am? And they said, oh, you're, some say you're, you know, a prophet or um, you know one of the Old Testament guys back from the dead or something and and uh, and he he turned and he said well who do you say that I am to Peter and Peter said what you're the you're the Messiah you're the Christ the Savior and he said good job Peter and he, now Jesus brought them to a place what we would call like um, an outdoor retreat to reveal who he really was to them you know in the midst of that beauty of God's handiwork he had something really important to teach him and that was who he really was it wasn't just a man they were following they were following the messiah the one sent to save us from our sins now paul paul we're coming to second corinthians if you will turn with me to, ch to chapter 2 verse 12 this morning we're gonna pick up where paul left off he said that he's writing to the church at corinth the church that he founded on his second missionary journey he stayed there for a year and a half as the pastor church planter teacher so he's writing to a crowd that he knows and he's dealing with problems they have he's also telling them i'm sorry i didn't come i my, it was my intention to to pass by we saw last week he, he actually said i can't wait to see you i want to see you on my way um to macedonia and then on my way, way back so i can get like a double blessing of visiting with you twice and you know when you have friends that and, and people in your lives that you have sown into their lives in the ministry and vice versa and you, you have encouraged each other. It's, you know, I can, I can hear like his heart saying, I can't wait 
that I could come see you guys on the way and on the way back. And he, and he wrote them and he said, now some people are saying that with me, yes is not yes and no is not no because I didn't come. He said, well, today we're going to see why he didn't come because he's going to explain it to him. He doesn't want, he said, look, that's not the case. God just had a different plan. And we always have to leave room for this, that God might have a different plan than we intended or what we were going to do. So Paul, verse 12, tells them now the details, what, why he didn't come to them for that double blessing going both ways. He said, when I came to Troas for the, for the gospel of Christ, he said, when, the, when, the, when there was a door that was open for me in the Lord, he, he saw God open. You ever felt like God opened a door for you to walk through in, in ministry? Like this is a divine appointment. The Lord just said, I'm sending you there. And you, you're just like, how did I? You, you didn't plan it. The Lord just set it up for you. And Paul is saying, there was a, a door open for me in the gospel. So Paul, now, what are you going to do if you're Paul and, you're, and there's a door open for you? You're going to go through it, right? So he says, I, I hadn't, but I had no rest for my spirit. I was not able to find Titus, he says, my brother. So taking leave of them at Troas, I left and I went on to Macedonia. But thanks be to God, he said, who always leads us in triumph, and in, in, in triumphs in Christ. Remember, this is, God doesn't always lead you in triumph outside of Christ, but you, he always leads you in triumphs in Christ. And so Paul goes on to tell us that God manifests through us a sweet aroma of the knowledge of him in every place. God, he says, we are his fragrance, a fragrance of Christ unto God amongst those who are being saved and amongst those who are perishing. And to the one, an aroma from death to death, to the other, an aroma from life to life. And who, he says, is adequate for these things. For we're not like many, Paul says, peddling or corrupting the word of God, but we are from sincerity speaking as we speak in Christ, he says, from God, we speak in Christ in the sight of God. We're just speaking these things from a sincere heart. Now, sincere, we went over. The Latin sin is without, sere is wax. And it's that term they used when they made the marble sculptures. You know, the, the craftsman is chiseling the little bust of the guy, Caesar or whatever. And if he, you know, marble's brittle. You hit it just right and pink. You know, they'd be carving away and the nose would pop off. And so the artisans would take wax, mix it with a little marble dust, and then smush the nose back on in place and patch in the holes and, and then sell the thing real quick on, uh, while it's cool in the morning. Because um, over there, and if you've been to, to that region, you know it gets really warm in the summer days. And what would happen is if, if the thing was not, w if it was made with wax, Cone settings that sensei without wax, then as soon as as soon as the heat's come on, what's going to happen to the statue? His nose is going to fall off. I mean, the thing you know, get ear plunk, you know, and you're like, that thing is not the genuine article. It's made with wax. It's it's a fake, and that's where we get the word sincerity from. Without wax, made the whole thing genuine stone, carved from the real thing. No, you know, patching, no filling in, no using a little wax to get by, but really done correctly. Do it done in genuineness. Well, Paul says we've been preaching in genuineness, the, the gospel of Christ. And we speak, he says, these words that we speak in Christ, we speak them in the sight of God. Now, this is something that I wish I could teach every person that, to pay attention to what you say. Because how many of us could say, everything I say, I say in the sight of God. It, by the way, if we did this, if we kept conscious that everything we are s saying is being watched by God, I think it might change some things we say. You know, probably for the better. Because we would realize, uh-oh, he's watching, isn't he? Now, sometimes people are, they don't even know why, but they say things to me like, Pastor, I don't know why, but I felt like there was this this presence watching over me. You know, I was going down the road and it, uh, there was a little ice on the road and it looked dangerous and started to slide and I just felt this calm presence like it's going to be okay. And, 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 and do you think that was God? <laughs> well, I'm pretty sure it probably wasn't a demon, but, uh, you know, 
the, 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 there is these things where the, where the Lord looks after us and sends his angels even, we read in the Psalms, to guard over us. Some people ask me, is there such a thing as a guardian angel? I said, I'm sure they're, they're there. Mine's got the flat forehead from going, ay, 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 here he goes again. <laughs> but um, we'll see him when they get there. The reality is yes. I mean, even the devil twisted a scripture when Jesus was being tempted Remember the three temptations? The last one, he took him up on a pinnacle, a high pinnacle, and said, cast yourself down from here. He says, and, and come on, if you're the Son of God, go ahead, jump. Won't his angels take charge concerning you? Won't they bear you up lest you dash your feet against the stone? Now, I find this interesting. A fallen angel is quoting the job description of an angel. Satan, by the way, is a fallen angel. And he's sitting here going, doesn't it say in the angelic handbook that the angels will bear you up lest you dash your foot against the stone? Go ahead. Chuck yourself off this high pinnacle and let, let the angels catch you. And what was Jesus' answer? Misquote on the handbook is what it was. He said, it's also written, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God or force a test on the Lord. You're not supposed to do that. Just because his angels have their job to do, you're not supposed to give them extra. They got enough just keeping up with us. You know? And so so Jesus didn't didn't discount that their that the job of angels, the part that by the way, Satan was quoting a scripture. He just left out a little bit of it. You know, he's a twister of the word. We don't want that. We want the whole word proclaimed in sincerity and spoken in the sight of God. You know, whatever we speak, hopefully we can say, look, I'm speaking this in the sight of God. That just so you know, what I'm telling you today, I have no trouble telling you that I'm doing this in the sight of the Lord. He's watching what I'm doing. Hopefully he's inspiring every word what will fall from my lips to, to, to be the words that you need for your, for your faith and your heart to grow closer to him for this week. I mean, this week, we don't know what lies ahead, but he does. And he might have some cool stuff you need today from his word just to get you prepped for this upcoming week. So I hope today, as we look at this, you will... I got a question for you. Paul said he, he said that God led him in triumph in Christ, always leading him in triumph, manifesting through him a sweet aroma, a sweet aroma of the knowledge of him in every place. He said, for we are a fragrance of Christ to God amongst those that are being saved. Did you realize you're a fragrance for the Lord? You know when you smell a nice fragrance, you go in a place, you smell a nice fragrance, you're like, oh, that smells appealing, that's really nice. When people come in contact with us, do they say, what a pleasant fragrance for God. They, they, they actually can sense there's a sweet aroma about the way we are, something that distinguishes us, that makes them go, wow, there, there's, a, there's a pleasant something that that smell there's something sweet about the way that, that when they come around me it's like god is with them he's he, he there's a presence there that's what paul is saying we are that fragrance amongst men now to the one he says we are an aroma from death to death those that are being saved and to those that are perishing we're an aroma of life to life now that might seem backwards to you and your first inspection you think, well, the guys that are believers, wouldn't we be an aroma of life to life? And that really wouldn't fit what Jesus taught us. Because Jesus taught us in John's Gospel, chapter 12, in verse 24, he said, you know, unless a, a, a seed would fall into the earth and die, it, it can't do what? It can't spring back to life. It will remain by itself. But anyone who wants to follow him, he said, if any man wants to come follow me, he says, you first have to be willing to lose your life. You have to let it go. You have to, there's a letting go, a dying to ourselves that we have to actually do. And it's not popular to teach. In, in most Christian circles, if you start off the sermon with, today we're going to talk about dying to yourself. Everyone just goes, click, we're leaving. You know, now listen to this guy. Because our whole culture says, live for yourself. Live for all the things for you. It's all about you. And when I listen to Jesus, Jesus says it's not all about us. It's all about others. It's a totally upside down principle. He goes and says, if you want to be great in my kingdom, you don't say everybody serve me. You go instead and say what? How can I serve you? How can I serve you all? If you want to be great, he said, in my kingdom, learn to be the servant of how many? All. Now that's not 
American Christianity. That's not popular. How let everyone join up? We're going to be servants of all. How to serve all? Well, the first way you serve, and that you're a real fragrant aroma of God to the people around you, to the other believers, is you die daily to yourself. You don't try to live for yourself. You try to say, no, I deny myself, like Jesus said. I pick up what? My cross, and I go follow him. And that's, a, that's not popular. I know that that's not in the, you know, um, is that in the seeker-sensitive movement? Do they do that? The die to yourself and go follow the Lord and, and, and lay down your lives for others. And most of the, most of the, the I've been here for 26 years, so I, I have people that visit me from the mainland and tell me, oh, that's not what they're teaching over there. And I go, well, I only know what to teach. And if it isn't in this book, you're not interested and I'm not interested in telling you. This is what you need to know. The Holy Scriptures, it says, testify everything. Hebrews chapter 9 tells us, Lo, it is written of him in the whole of the scroll or the volume of the book. This entire book is to point you to Jesus. And the reason you need to know about Jesus is because we're all sinners. And he, he's the Savior of sinners. He's the one that came to save us. And if I'm going to be fragrant in my aroma about Christ to other believers, I can't be the Christian who's living for himself. That's, that's self-centered Christianity. It's all about me, me, me. But Christ wants us to be dying to ourselves and living for others. And that's what it's truly about, guys, is that we're here to just live for Christ. Die to ourselves and follow what he has for us. And Jesus said, if you want to be my follower, you want to come follow me, what did he say? Deny yourself. Pick up that cross and come follow me. I got, I got something for you. And as you do that, it is freeing, isn't it? When you die to yourself and you go, okay, here I am, Lord. I'll just live how you want me. What, whatever you want to do, you set my appointment book. Wow, things begin to happen. And those divine appointments begin to happen in your life. And you become a fragrant aroma to other believers from death to death. Now, to the ones that are perishing, he says, you become a fragrant aroma of life unto life. You are the glimpse of everlasting life, whether you realize it or not. To someone who's perishing, you might be the closest thing to heaven they, they get to experience. You know, if they're not going to come to know the Lord, this is the closest to heaven they'll get. And I, I, if you're a believer, by the way, this earthly life is the closest to hell you're going to get. So just keep it in perspective, you know. This bad day down here, you just go, that's okay. It's the worst it'll ever be. Once I get to heaven, it's all, see, we're on an upward bound track, aren't we? But for the non-believer, this is, I mean, they're like going, I better soak this up because well, what lies ahead isn't going to be any fun. And when they come in contact with us, oh, I pray that they get an aroma of life, spiritual-led life that is living in us, breathing in us, that God is working in us, and they go, wow, that was an aroma of life. I, that, you know, when you, when you smell a pleasant aroma, something really attractive, I mean, for those of you, I don't, I know we're before lunch hour, I shouldn't probably say this one as an analogy, but you know, if you've been down in the south where they do a lot of barbecue, and you don't actually have to advertise your store. You, you, they have this technique, it's called just fan, the stuff that's on the barbecue and let the let the the smell of the of the meats just waft into the air and people come crawling up man they just like out of everywhere they just follow their nose man that smells good let's go over there and, and the, it's one of the surefire ways to find a good place to 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 eat if you're not a vegetarian like Cindy but for us meat eaters you go and you're like oh man I can follow that aroma all we need is a pleasant aroma to draw us to that place. And hopefully our lives are a pleasant aroma to people who are perishing that makes them want to be drawn to that place. To Where are you eating? Well, I need that food. I need that spiritual food for me. And Paul says, we've got that food. And we're not peddling the food, he said, like, like some of the guys. We're not here trying to sell you the word of God. We're here giving it in freedom. Now, chapter 3, Paul goes on, he says in verse 1, Are we beginning to commend ourselves to you again? 
Do I have to, like, you know, get a letter of commendation for you guys? He says, or do we even need as some a letter of commendation to you or from you? He said, you guys are, are, are our letter written in our hearts. You are known and you are read by all men. Being manifested that you are a letter of Christ. You're cared for by us. You're written not with ink, but you're written with the spirit of the living God. And you're not written on the tablets of stone, but you're written on the tablets of human hearts. You're our letter, Paul says, that to people. You know, and by the way, how many people does he say read the letter? Verse 2. Would you maybe highlight that for me in your Bible? How many people are reading the letter of our lives? Did you realize that your life is a letter that's being read by men? How many men does it say? All. All men are watching you and reading the letter that is your life. Whether you like it or not, I'm sorry. This is, this is just one of those facts I'd like to point out to every Christian, especially the ones who feel called to, to serve in ministry. You know, we got Herb serving as the chaplain at the hospital. Whether he likes it or not, he already knows this because he's been doing this for many years, but do they watch us, Herb, in all that we do? I mean, from the time we park the car in the parking lot at the hospital to you walk in, people watch all your behavior. Your, li your life is a letter that is being read. And by the way, some of you might not realize it, but you're, you know, you're like the only letter some of these people are ever going to read about God. They may never pick up this book that's filled with 66 different letters written. 66 books. Not all of them were letters. Some were historical books. Some were psalms and songs and poetical books. But, but this collection right here, they may never read. But whether you like it or not, they're going to read your life. They watch you. They watch how you come, how you go, how you behave in between how you are with your kids, how you are with your peers, how you are with your boss. You know, you can say a lot about, about your faith with the Lord just by how you behave at work. And you don't even have to preach Jesus with words. You just live it. You live Jesus. And, you're, and your coworkers are watching you. And they're, they're reading your faith. I had one person come to me and said, Pastor, you got to pray for me. My coworkers are really mad at me. I, I, they want me to get fired because I won't steal a pencil from work. I wouldn't take the boss's pencils or pens or paper or any of the office products. And they all always put some in their, you know, in their bag or their purse or whatever, and they leave with it all the time. And, and one of them got really mad, like, how come you never take any stuff? I mean, don't you know you're supposed to sta steal from the boss? And This person was like, um, I don't know don't think that's correct you know that's not not what I'm supposed to do and they started a, like a, an inter-office campaign of hate against this Christian because this Christian they were convicted just by this Christian not stealing they're like well we don't like you anymore because you're making us uncomfortable because we all steal and th th he's going well still not going to make me do it your life is being read. You might not realize. They're watching. Down to whether you take a pencil from work. I mean, you think, yes, they're always being read. And this is something that would be good for us to recognize. Not only everything we do can we do and say it in the sight of God, but realize you need to be able to do it and say it in front of the sight of, of, of those that you want to be a light to. Because they're watching and reading your life. And what they're reading is what, what is not written on paper, but written where? Paul said it, on the tablet of your heart. You know, the Bible's very clear. Jesus says it's not what goes into a man's mouth that defiles him. See, whatever Jesus said, whatever you put in your mouth, right, goes through your stomach, through your digestive tract, and out the other end, it's gone. It's eliminated, he said. It never touches the heart. Isn't it interesting Jesus knew the whole biology of Food doesn't even touch the heart as it goes through our, our digestive process. He knew exactly. I mean, who taught him biology anyway? How did he know this? He said, but whatever goes into a man, 
He says it's not it's not the food that goes in that defiles the heart. What did he say defiles the heart? What comes out of the mouth. He said because what the words what come out of this mouth, where do they originate? He said, in the heart. So if I don't get the heart clean, <laughs> you can always tell what's in someone's heart really easy. And by the way, this is I've shared this many a time, but for you gals, the dating tip 101. You want to know what's in this guy's heart. Listen to what comes out of this. This little pie hole will reveal what's in his heart. You know, if he starts talking about all he cares about is going to the, you know, car show or to the race or to this or he, he's into whatever thing, he's going to tell you. Just listen. Out of a man's mouth flows what's in his heart. And if there's a whole bunch of garbage coming out of the mouth, you think, wow, that's like verbal vomit, you know some pukey sewage stuff. Uh, my wife always would correct our kids. I don't want to hear anything coming out of your mouth what comes out of this. <laughs> Am I allowed to do that at church? I <laughs> just realized that might not be. Well, uh, it's just uh, If it comes out from back here, it shouldn't come out from here. And I agree. When kids start using words that come close to sound like what's coming out of here, this shouldn't be coming out of your mouth. But this is something, something that well, you realize in the dating realm, and this goes for you guys looking at the gal, if you want to know what's in her heart, listen to what comes out of her mouth. If there's a bunch of verbal stuff that's just foul, you know what's in here now. Foul. And that needs to be changed. And don't, don't ever be deceived and think, well, I'll fix it. Please, save me hours of <coughs> counseling. And you're not going to like what I tell you anyway at the end because I'm going to tell you you can't fix that, only Christ can. And you would have been better off not getting together with them first, let Christ fix it first if you didn't like it. Because if you don't like it now, don't expect it to change. It, they, they come that way. If you can put up with that and, and, and you know Christ is at work in their lives and it's just an area he hasn't gotten to yet and you're willing to be patient for that, okay. My wife, God bless her, she waited through a lot of refining on me. I always wonder, why did she take me? But I'm glad. You know, this is a, a blessing. So I can tell you that it's better that you listen to what comes out of this thing because you'll know what's in their heart. And you, whether you realize it or not, how many of you think the letter God's writing in the tablet of your heart is a, a good read? For people, you know, it helps their, f if they could just read what was going on in my heart, that could help them. Now, I know some of you are going, wait a minute, doesn't it say the heart is desperately wicked and who can know? And yep, it does. That's why we sang Psalm 51, created me a what? A clean heart, oh God. Renew a right spirit. Make my heart a heart that is, well, written upon by your spirit. He said it's not written on with ink. It's written on by the Spirit of the living God. Do you know that the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of our living God, writes this wonderful letter on your heart? A letter that men will read. They'll see things in your life and go, wow. I share this because I know that, you know, God has brought me a long way. I'm, not, I'm nowhere near where I want to be. Like Paul said, you know, not that I have arrived, but I press on to that higher and upward call. I'm still a work in progress. You, you all realize that, right? You, you didn't come here thinking the pastor's perfect. I hope you didn't. I'll, I'll let you in for a big disappointment today. You could, you could check with my wife on that one. But, but the reality is, is that we, we are works in progress. You guys know that, right? Paul wrote to the was it church at Philippi, for I am confident of this very thing that he who began a good work in you will be what? Faithful to complete it. That just tells me every time I need a reminder, I'm still a work in progress. But I want to keep progressing. And I want that work that God's Spirit is doing in me to continue because, well, let me just read you this last paragraph today. We're, we're not going to complete the whole chapter, but, but this part is really a, a great thought to end on today. It says, verse 4 says, Such confidence we have through Christ towards God not that we are adequate in ourselves to consider anything as, as well coming from ourselves, but he says, rather, 
He says, <clears throat> our adequacy is from God, who has made us adequate as servants of a new covenant, not of the letters, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills. Remember the letter of the law of Moses, how Paul acknowledged in the book of Romans, it, it, it brought death. But he says, but the letter of the Spirit, that, that the things that the Spirit does, that gives life. This law of liberty that comes from the Spirit of God, what a beautiful thing. But who makes us adequate or qualified to be one of these vessels or servants of this new covenant? Christ. That's right. God, God, you know, I loved, I heard this one time, the guy goes, God does not call the qualified. He qualifies the called. You know, and I always thought, I think that's a verse, but not said exactly, because English isn't my first language. I think in thoughts more than in the particular specific words in the sentence. I try to grasp what's the idea that they're saying. And I, I don't always read in my English Bible, I'll read in my Italian Bible, and the thought can be presented with like a different analogy. Like in this part, it's, um, you know, the at, what makes you adequate or um, in Italian, the word is to, to make you qualified or not corrupted, a, a vessel ready to do it. And I was like, yeah, what makes me able to be like that? It's not me. I know that. It's Christ. Christ is the one who does that. And if, if I'm willing to let that letter be written on my heart that this guy standing before you is here before you as, um, well, what makes me adequate to do this calling? God. God is the one who makes us adequate for anything he calls us to. And you don't have to worry about some of you, because this is, this is a hindrance for a lot of Christians. They're like, well, I know I... God, I, I kind of feel like God wants to use me. But who am I? And I'm not really qualified. Do you think that hangs God up? He goes, wow, I can't use Peter. Not qualified. <laughs> Matthew, Nick say on him. John's always squabbling with Peter about that stuff and James and those two guys. Oh, Sons of Thunder. You know that that was their nickname, right? How do you get the nickname Sons of Thunder? They farted a lot? I don't know. I mean, what, 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 why do these guys get this nickname? You think they got along? When you read about them telling the stories, you can tell there's some competition between them. And, you know, you, you read about Thomas doubting the Lord after the other guys are all saying, we've seen him risen from the dead. We saw the holes in his hands. We touched him. And Thomas is like, I, won't be, I don't believe you guys. It tells you how much they trusted each other. I won't believe it till I stick my finger in the hole in his hand. Till I stick my hand in his side. These guys were not what we call the, you know, super dozen chosen perfect guys. They were, there were some messed up guys in the group. There was even that one guy that betrays Jesus at the end. Judas. And he got into the club and you go, what, God, you call these people and you have specific things for them to do. And just so you know, the Lord's calling in your life. He knows what he's calling you to do. But what makes you adequate to do that calling is it's not found in you. In fact, it's not even expected to be found in you. If you can receive this, our adequacy is from God. Mahalo for joining us. If you'd like more information about us, go to our website, AmazingGraceKona.com and click the link to follow us on Facebook. That's AmazingGraceKona.com. Mahalo and God bless.